ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to today's lecture. Our lecture today is going to be Mr. Ian Fishbeck. In a nutshell, because Ian has an extensive and very colorful and diverse biography, he's currently a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. He researches the rule of law with special focus on laws of war. Prior to his transition to academia, he served for over a decade, including four combat tours as an officer of the U.S. Special Forces and Paratroopers. During that time, he made a stand against, against the Bush administration's illegal torture program. As someone who has spent four tours, in, uh, one in Afghanistan and three in Iraq, and someone who has extensive experience in military uniform, and who is at the same time a philosopher currently pursuing his PhD thesis, Ian considerably shed a lot of light on this delicate issue and question of uh, the dynamic relationship between obedience and responsibility, both essential to the military organization. So without further ado, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so this is part of a general project to assess um, the structure of the morality of war and also the structure of the laws of war. And one of the interesting features of arguments about the laws of war is that there seems to be a fundamental conceptual misunderstanding. So one of my goals is to correct for that misunderstanding. I'll talk about it in greater detail later, but the, the main point is that it's commonly accepted that there is not an obedience to orders defense in the laws of war. And I think that that's a mistake. It goes back to Nuremberg and the rejection of some obedience to orders defenses at Nuremberg, but that doesn't generalize to all defenses. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about ICTY cases, although the Erdemovich case is of particular interest to me because I think one of the account, one of the implications of, of my argument might be that Erdemovich was treated unjustly not because he wasn't wrong in what he did, but because he was probably excused to a large degree. And if we interpret obedience to orders defenses properly, he probably shouldn't have been legal, legally liable to the punishment he was given. I'm working with someone else on that, someone who was a prosecutor on the ICTY, and he's bringing that expertise to the project. My expertise mainly has to do with the interrogational program in the United States during the war on terror, and my dissatisfaction with the fact that lower-ranking soldiers were scapegoated, and higher-ranking officers and politicians who were clearly responsible for the program were not held accountable. I see that as fundamentally inconsistent with the way command responsibility and obedience to orders functioned in both the Nuremberg trials and the Tokyo trials after World War II. But it is somewhat consistent with other U.S. trials, such as Lieutenant Kelly and the My Live Massacre. So the United States generally does a very poor job of self-policing. Um, so this is a background of who I am. Uh, sometimes there's a misunderstanding, because I say I'm a soldier, um, I was a soldier, but I was a very particular kind of soldier, and it, it doesn't exist in many foreign militaries. Uh, well, militaries other than the United States. So I was special forces. Special forces for most countries involves things like uh, hostage rescue, um, specialized targeting of high value targets. Um, my particular expertise was going to embed with people from a foreign culture with a small team and work with those people to build political and military units to help them stabilize their political situation. Uh, so in a lot of ways it was very similar to statecraft or anthropology or political science field work. And it was very different from a lot of military work in several respects. Uh, I was almost fluent in Arabic, and if I would have drawn my weapon 
I was almost certainly going to die in a lot of situations. Not in all situations, but I was frequently in situations where if I would have had to draw my weapon, then I would have died. Uh, because there were more, more, there were more people there from the culture I was working with, and if they decided that I needed to be confronted, they outnumbered me by a considerable margin. I'm also a little bit unorthodox because I'm critical of the U.S. military. And by the time I was completing my service as a U.S. soldier, I had a tendency to have a closer affinity to the Arabs I worked with than I did to the United States because of my experiences. So a U.S. person would tend to accuse me of going native, becoming too close to the native people. That's enough about me. Uh, let's put this argument in context. We might think that the laws of war are a stable system that's been the same over time. This is probably empirically inaccurate. It's not true. The laws of war change over time. But they have been relatively stable since World War II maybe since both world wars. Recently there have been criticisms of moral beliefs that tend to reflect the law of war. So in the law of war, for example, there's a belief that combatants from opposing sides have a right to kill each other. That, that right is enshrined in international law Moral philosophers tend to say, well, there's a moral right, there's a corollary of that legal right. That view has been criticized. There's another argument about the morality of war that's been criticized and the law of war that's been criticized, and that's the domestic analogy. So the idea is that in international relations, States have a right to self-defense, to go to war in self-defense, just as individuals have a right to resort to violence in self-defense in domestic contexts. Michael Walzer is probably the most famous philosopher who advances this argument, and he does so in a book called Just and Unjust Wars. Walzer claims that the domestic analogy can explain use ad bellum, which is the morality and law that is about a state's right to resort to war, but that the domestic analogy cannot explain use in bellum, which is individual conduct within war once war occurs. The recent critics, who tend to be known as reductivist revisionists, uh, among them are Jeff McMahon, Helen Froh, uh, David Rodin might be considered a reductivist revisionist. Uh, they've criticized Walls or generally in the domestic analogy specifically, and they do so by using hypothetical cases of self-defense. They'll ask, in a situ certain situation, let's say two people meet each other in an alley or whatever, and one person draws a weapon on the other, is someone justified in using lethal self-defense? And then they'll, they'll use intuitions from those cases in order to claim that there are general principles, and then they'll apply those principles to war. And then they'll claim that the current laws of war and the morality of war that tracks those laws of war is mistaken. I've argued against that view. I've defended the traditional Walzerian account of the domestic analogy. And the way I do that is I say that there's variance in intuitions about self-defense among people. And that variance is attributable to non-moral features of the social conditions in which they live. People who live in well-policed societies, societies that have 
established police systems or where police systems have been established over time and they've adapted culturally to that system, they tend to think that their, the right to self-defense is very restricted and that you should only be justified in self-defense when you cannot call on the police and there's an imminent threat. Societies who are adapted to conditions without police, and it's an important asterisk here, is that those societies might have police right now, but it's a cultural artifact from history that they used to live in situations where they didn't have police, so they adapted to that. They tend to have different views about self-defense, and their views allow for more force in order to defend against what are traditionally considered lesser infractions. And they also uh, do not require calling the police. And those intuitions are more like our intuitions about the resort to war. So there is an analogy between people's intuitions when those people are adapted to conditions without police and our beliefs about a state's right to resort to war. Most moral philosophers come from a situation where they have well-developed police. I mean, Belgrade, Belgrade is a nice city. You can call the police and they'll probably come. Uh, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan right now. You can certainly call on the police. Jeff McMahon lives in Oxford. He can certainly call on the police and count on them. Uh, so their intuitions aren't the right intuitions to use when we're thinking about whether or not war is similar to self-defense. Because international society doesn't have a police system like domestic society. Now, that's all well and good. But then I run in, into a problem because I actually do think that maybe there's one morality that unites use at Bellum and use in Bellum, and that's different than Walzer. So my argument up to that point supports some of Walzer's conclusions. But I don't understand how, if, if, if the domestic analogy can explain use at bellum, use at bellum, it seems to me that it also ought to tell us something about use in bellum. Tell us about what soldiers can do and what they can't do. Uh, and the way I want to make that jump is to say, well, Walzer said that domestic analogy only applied to use at bellum and it didn't apply to use in Bella. I want to say something different. I want to say use ad bellum applies to both, but there is something else going on in use in Bella in addition to the domestic analogy that makes use in Bella look very different than use ad bellum. The heart of understanding how that works is understanding that war is carried out by collectives and that collectives function in certain ways. And one of the interesting things about collectives is hierarchy. This is particularly true of military collectives. You have a hierarchy with a command structure. Commanders give orders. Soldiers are expected to obey orders. The question is, how should this function? But there's an additional question, how does it function? And when I ask that first, the, the question, how does it function, I come up with a different answer than most moral philosophers and most legal scholars. And so my first task is to reconceptualize how it functions and then provide a moral account that explains why that's justified. So how is obedience to order structured in the law of war? There's a common belief about law and morality, and that belief is that combatants, soldiers, sailors, airmen, etc., have a respondeat superior justification for obeying orders to participate in a war. A respondeat superior justification is Latin, what it means is, let the superior answer. So, in practical terms, 
when a combatant receives an order from a superior officer to participate in a war, it's the superior officer that's morally and legally responsible. We're talking about the law here, so it's legally, legally responsible for issuing the order. The combatant is not responsible for the order. Therefore, if the combatant participates in an illegal war, the combatant is not legally liable. However, it's different for use in Bella. Combatants do have absolute liability for obeying orders regulating the conduct of war. Those are use in Bella orders. So a common belief is that if a commander issues an order to a combatant, to torture, to kill civilians intentionally, etc., then the subordinate is legally required to disobey that order. And they have absolute liability for obeying that order. What absolute liability means is that if the soldier follows the order, there are no excuses permitted for that subordinate. There are no possible justifications either for that subordinate. So the, the soldier or the combatant is absolutely liable for disobeying a use in bubble order. You can see the radical difference between these two situations. The soldier has a legal right and even a duty to obey orders to participate in an illegal war and should not question those orders. However, once the war is underway, the soldier has an absolute liability for committing war crimes during the course of that war. There are no appeals to obedience to orders. Now, Michael Walzer and other Orthodox just war theorists and reductivist revisionist just war theorists like McCann both agree that this is the what law and common sense morality are. The reductivist revisionist will criticize the way those beliefs are. The orthodox just war theorists will argue that those beliefs can be defended. The way the reductivist revisionists usually argue against uh, the current structure as they see it is they call these, these two beliefs, the beliefs about obeying orders in use and, and obeying orders in use and inconsistent. My argument is that their understanding of the law is mistaken and that once we reconceptualize the law, there is no inconsistency. And therefore, step one is to show that this understanding of the war is mistaken. There's not an absolute liability for obeying orders in the commission of war crime. You can, as sometimes combatants are permitted to use an obedience to orders defense. And once one realizes that, one realizes that use in bello law and use at bello law are not inconsistent. The crux of understanding this is the way obedience to orders works in the law is combatants are only required to disobey orders that are manifestly unjust. It means it has to be obviously unjust. If a commander orders a war crime that isn't obviously unjust, the combatant has a duty to follow that order and a legal defense during charges of war crimes. The commander will be held to account and the subordinate will not. There's a responding at superior defense. So the division between the responding at superior defense and the absolute liability is not use ad bellum and use in bello, it's actually manifest illegality. The difference between use ad bellum and use in bello is not one is resort to war and one is conduct in war. It's that there are almost never manifestly illegal orders to participate in war. For a lot of reasons. One of the reasons is combatants almost never have the information that's required to realize that a, a particular war is manifestly illegal. They might suspect, but they'll never know for sure. This is different than use in bellow because there are categorical prohibitions in use in bellow, such as do not torture ever. 
And once you get a law that says, do not do whatever it is, X, ever, then a soldier knows that any order to commit that type of activity is illegal, and therefore has a duty to disobey that order. There's a middle ground of use in Bello that doesn't have categorical prohibitions of act types. Two very clear examples are the principles of proportionality and necessity. Soldiers are required to adhere to proportionality and necessity. But adherence to proportionality and necessity is always open to dispute. And it's never manifestly illegal. So if there are ever war crimes charges brought for violating proportionality and necessity, they're brought to commanders and not to subordinates. And there are clear cases from Nuremberg where this is the case. All right. This is the philosophical structure of the argument. I'll let you read it. So this is a common revisionist critique of the traditional understanding of the law and morality of war. And we can look at the first premise. And my argument is that the first premise is wrong. Because there's a misunderstanding about the law. And that's what I just explained about responding as superior and absolute liability. And once we acknowledge that, premise three is also wrong. Because combatants usually face similar duress and epistemic challenges when they comply with orders to go to war as they do when they comply with orders to carry acts within war. The lone exception is when a use in bellow act type is categorically prohibited. Therefore, consistent application of these considerations should lead to the legal and moral prescriptions expressed in the first premise, which is a proper understanding of the law of war as it currently stands. So there's no inconsistency. And that's the conclusion. There's no inconsistency. Now, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that the laws of war and the moral beliefs that track the laws of war are justified. It's a counter-argument to a specific objection, the inconsistency objection that the revisionists assert. But I think it's an important argument because, it, it, A, it reconceptualizes the law of war, and B, it helps us understand the function of command and some of the functions of complex organizations, collective organizations, and how authority and justifications work in the structure of the law. Is this an accurate account of the laws of war? I think the clearest example that this is how the law of war works is, in, is from the hostage case from World War II during the Nuremberg Tribunals after World War II. There was a German unit in a region called Finnmark towards the end of World War II. Finnmark is in the Arctic regions of, of um, the northern portion of the Nordic regions. And as the Soviets advanced, 
it was clear that the Germans were going to have to effect a retreat. And the commander of German forces was named Lothar Rendulich. And he gave an order to conduct a scorched earth campaign to destroy all civilian infrastructure. Civilians were, for the most part, evacuated uh, forcibly when necessary. And then all civilian buildings, all food stores, etc., were destroyed, mostly through fire. And Rendulich's reason for doing this was he wanted to slow down the Soviet advance. His argument was that his unit would be overtaken if he didn't force the Soviets to overcome logistical challenges associated with resupply and navigating unfamiliar terrain. So he wanted to deny local food and wares and fuel, and he also wanted to deny local guides to the advancing Soviet army. The way the law of war is structured is that it is lex specialis, it's a special kind of law that displaces ordinary law while war is happening. So, in ordinary domestic society, there's an absolute prohibition against killing. But you can justify killing, you can justify homicide, if certain conditions obtain. Justified self-defense, for example. What the laws of war do is they displace that law. And they replace it with a different background prima facie condition, a different assumption. And that assumption is that combatants don't require a justification for killing other combatants. As a matter of fact, they don't require justification for killing anyone unless positive law prohibits killing. Positive law does prohibit killing non-combatants, therefore combatants are not permitted to kill non-combatants without justification. So what happens is the way justification functions in the law changes. It goes from homicide, all homicide requires justification to there's a whole class of homicide that doesn't require justification at all, namely combatants killing combatants. So justification, I think in the legal and the moral philosophy literature, there's, there's a misunderstanding of the types of justification. There's an assumption that legal justification in a court of law is all that matters, but that's not true. There's also, it's almost like a public accountability justification where you have to explain yourself. Okay. And one really easy way to understand this is when combatants kill other combatants, we don't make them explain themselves. If an Axis soldier kills an Allied soldier in World War II, we don't ask, why'd you do that? No justification is required. However, Laws of war do require justifications for killing non-combatants. And necessity is part of those justifications. It's almost always the case that necessity has to be part of the justification. It's not sufficient, but it's necessary for a justification to obtain for killing civilians. And when civilians are killed, there's almost always a need for a public justification, to be prepared for a public justification. And if that justification isn't acceptable, or at least contested, then it might go to a court of law, although very rarely. Then there are categorical prohibitions that don't admit of necessity justifications. Torture is such a prohibition. The law of war is different from the law that we might think of as governing ordinary life. If you, I don't like that term, but we'll use that term. In that there are act types that don't admit of necessity justifications. These almost never occur in domestic law. 
But in war, we have these categorical prohibitions where the law of war is such that it explicitly states, unless a prohibition explicitly in positive law admits of a necessity justification, necessity justifications will not be admitted. You cannot claim to have a necessity justification for torture. You cannot claim to have a necessity justification for perfidy. You cannot have, you cannot claim to have a necessity justification for intentionally killing non-combatants. It is, however, written in positive law that killing, or not killing, destroying civilian infrastructure does admit of necessity justifications, or at least this was the case during World War II. So the positive law in World War II said necessity justifications are permitted in the case of destroying civilian infrastructure. So what that means in practical terms is that if a commander destroys civilian infrastructure, that commander has to provide a justification, and if that justification is contested, that commander may have to face a trial, a criminal trial. And that's why Rendulich was on trial. He didn't violate an absolute prohibition, but he violated a positive law that admitted of a necessity justification. So we can see that this is an interesting kind of middle ground. Had Rangelich only targeted enemy combatants, that wouldn't require justification at all. Had Rangelich done something that didn't admit of necessity justifications, then he almost certainly would have been found guilty. But since he did something that admitted of a necessity justification, he was held to account and had to go to trial. And then the question was, well, is he going to be found guilty? And the tribunal's judgment was really interesting. For one thing, the tribunal said that Rendulich was clearly unjustified from an omniscient, all-knowing, God's eye perspective after the fact, based on the facts of the case. He did not need to conduct a scorched earth campaign in order to effect a retreat in the face of the Red Army. He could have retreated without doing that. However, the tribunal also said that that is not an appropriate standard for legal liability for command decisions. Commanders need to be held responsible for the information they had at the time using a reasonable person standard. And at the time Rendulus made the decision the tribunal determined that he had good reason to think that the Scorched Earth campaign was necessary. And therefore, Rendulich was found not guilty of this particular count. So, in terms of liability, Rendulich was liable to provide a justification. He was also liable to provide a justification in a court of law. But the court of law did not find Rendulich liable to legal punishment. What I want to contrast that with is Rendulich's subordinates. Rendulich's subordinates were complicit in the same act. It had the same justifications. Rendulish's subordinates were not required to provide justifications. They weren't required to justify themselves publicly. They weren't required to stand before a court of law, the tribunal, and provide justifications. And they certainly weren't held criminally liable. If we want to understand how obedience to orders works in the law of war, we're not going to find it in case law. And the reason we're not going to find it in case law is because when no obedience to orders defense obtains, prosecutors rarely charge or indict. 
So there is no case law. So if you want to understand how obedience to orders functions in the law of war, you have to look at case law and look for situations where commanders are charged and subordinates are not. And in Nuremberg and Tokyo, there's a very consistent theme where commanders are charged, they occasionally appeal to obedience to orders, and that obedience to orders defense is almost always rejected. And because of that, many people think that obedience to orders is always rejected in the law. But if one looks at a more complete record of the people who weren't even brought to trial, one can see that actually obedience to orders is respected as a defense. It's just not a defense that a commander can appeal to. It's a defense that a subordinate can appeal to. Now, one reason for this is that necessity justifications aren't manifestly illegal. Had the subordinates tortured, intentionally killed civilians, etc., then they would have been liable to provide justification, probably liable to criminal punishment. But there, there are at least two cases where there is reason to believe that the U.S. carries out victor's justice. So the law of war is structured such that the international community only intervenes to try uh, accused war criminals if the state from which the war criminal hails, comes from, cannot carry out the legal proceedings on its own. And because of the political status of the United States, the United States can almost always claim that it should try its own accused war criminal. My problem with this system is the U.S. almost always violates the standard that was set out in Nuremberg and Tokyo. There's a double standard. So, Mi Lai is one example. Uh, Captain Medina gives Lieutenant Cowley an order to kill civilians. It's vague. There's a trial. Cowley's obedience to orders defense is rejected. He's convicted and later paroled. 25 other soldiers are tried, they're all acquitted. It's an egregious war crime, if you don't know anything about the lies. Rape, murder, obviously, man, they're manifestly illegal acts. Cali himself gets a very light punishment. So almost no one is held to account. And this is generally regarded as a blemish on the U.S. military's ability to hold itself accountable. Now, when I was a cadet at West Point, this was a case that was used to illustrate command responsibility. And Medina was clearly responsible, and in my opinion, uh, well, in my opinion, Medina was responsible, but Cali was, there was widespread agreement that Cali was responsible. And the idea was, well, we can't let this happen again. And then, we have 9-11, and we have a counter-terrorist, counter-insurgency campaign in Iraq, <coughs> And there is widespread U.S. torture. The, the torture program is ordered at a very high level. And it's disputed at a very high level. And the people who object to the torture program are marginalized. And senior leaders push forward with the torture program anyway. And then there are scandals, the most prominent of which is probably Abu Ghraib, uh, where U.S. soldiers clearly torture detainees. And the response of the United States is to claim that those soldiers were bad apples. And that they were disobeying orders. When those soldiers go to trial, their obedience to orders defense is rejected. So what we have is an inversion of command responsibility. If we accept Nuremberg and Tokyo is the appropriate understanding of the law of war, 
then the senior commanders are legally liable and the junior soldiers are not. Yet what happens when the U.S. commits war crimes is that standard is inverted. Subordinates are scapegoated and commanders diffuse responsibility and do not provide legal justification. The way this tends to happen is that commanders intentionally undermine the manifest illegality of act types. So torture is a really interesting example of this because what the United States attempted to do was redefine torture. And say, oh, well that's not torture, that's something else, that's enhanced interrogation. And what this did was it muddied the waters so subordinates were left without a clear understanding of what was prohibited. Uh, when I challenged the Bush administration, that was my main point. I had several points. One of which was, there's widespread disagreement about what's accepted in the U.S. military for detainee treatment. And some people think you can beat detainees. Some people think you can psychologically torture detainees. Some people think that you can do myriad other things. Other people think you can't do anything. Uh, some really clear examples of the widespread understanding that torture was permitted come from special forces. So I was in a group, so I get selected for special forces training in 2004. And I'm going through the training, and I think it was 2005, where I'm in a room in Fort Benning, and, or maybe, maybe I'll start with this one. Anyway, I'm in a room in 2005 in Fort Benning. There's about, like imagine that you are all selected for special forces training. You're all officers, so you're all going to command special forces detachments. And you're in training to learn what you should do as a special forces officer. Imagine that I'm your senior officer, and I'm charged with training you. Okay. So I'm in, I'm in the group with you. The person who's training us has us watch a movie, The Battle for Algiers. And The Battle for Algiers is about the French counterinsurgency campaign in Algeria. The French used torture, and it's clearly depicted in the movie. And the instructor's clear lesson from watching the movie was that torture was necessary to defeat terrorist networks. And the reason that was given was that terrorist networks are organized into cells, and the way to defeat cellular organizations is to capture someone in a cell, interrogate that person quickly, get information about other people in that cell, and immediately conduct a raid to capture the other people in the cell. Because if you wait, then that information will no longer be useful. And the only way to get information quickly is to torture. My argument against the instructor's argument was that the French lost. And a large reason why they lost was because they used torture. So we had a professional disagreement on that point. There was no disagreement that the instructor and in his official in his official capacity as a representative of the United States government expected all the future special forces detachment commanders to torture people. There was no dispute on that point. And it wasn't about torture light or enhanced interrogation techniques. It was about the French in Algeria. So the government were like somehow off the rails or not representative of what was actually going on in the army are just unfounded. This was official training. And then after that briefing, we had a follow-on conversation and I explained, well, we have a lack of clarity here. And the result is that soldiers in the army don't know what they're supposed to do and then when they do what they think they're supposed to do, they get in trouble for it, and that's unfair. So if you really want to use a torture program, 
then you need to bring it above board so that soldiers don't get scapegoated. My instructor completely agreed with me on that point. We were in complete agreement. He's like, well, yeah, I disagree with you about torture being effective, but if we use it, it should be clear what soldiers are permitted to do. And so, at the end of the day, I advanced at least two arguments to the U.S. government. One was, hey, we need clear standards because this is unfair to soldiers. And another argument was that we shouldn't torture at all. And my reason, I, there was agreement with my trainer on the first point and disagreement on the latter point. Uh, but if we look at the way the U.S. government handled prosecution, Afterwards, it's very clear that those soldiers were scapegoated. There was one, oh, that was another thing too. Is, uh, when I was in Special Forces training and I was confronting torture, one of my senior NCOs came up to me and he, he, it wasn't confrontational at all. He just looked at me and he said, Look, you don't understand. Rumsfeld wanted us to torture the people that I would grab. The thing that the soldiers did wrong was they took pictures. So, it doesn't matter whether or not it's true that Rumsfeld actually wanted soldiers to believe that. According to the law, Rumsfeld is responsible for the command climate that led to soldiers believing that that's what Rumsfeld wanted them to do. And if we accept that, which is the correct version of the law, people like General Abzai should be in jail and people like Lindsay England should have those facts taken into account in their defense. Whether or not they should still be found guilty is a separate issue. Um, in general, their sentences should at least be mitigated. And this isn't only a problem of criminal liability. It's also a problem of public perception of wrongdoing. So... What Abuse wants to do is he wants to say something like, I didn't do anything wrong. And he wants the public to perceive that he didn't do anything wrong. And therefore, the cost of doing that is that the public perceives that Lindy England, completely on her own, with no contextual influence whatsoever, no command influence, just goes off on her own and does these completely heinous things. Which is not true. I'm not saying that I would not have done what Lindy England did. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that what Lindy England did was predictable given the command climate and the overall context into which Lindy England was placed. And to render the judgment that she's somehow against the wishes of her command and against her orders and against everything the commanders had done, just went on her own and did this, is absolutely false. Uh, there are questions about whether or not the law of war has changed and whether or not the U.S. government is accountable for war crimes. Should there be additional legal considerations for scapegoating subordinates? Should the law of war be clearer about manifestly illegal act types? And how do we do that? Uh, and do the law and morality come apart in these situations? Uh, my general sense is that one of the primary problems that leads to these types of situations is that we have a lack of clarity in the law that regulates counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. There's widespread agreement that if we're in a conventional war, the laws of war as we traditionally understand them are in effect. And if we're in Belgrade or Ann Arbor or anywhere else, Vienna, we know they're not in effect as long as we've done a war. And then we have these middle ground situations, Iraq after the invasion. Uh, some periods of time during the Balkans War, I think we're like this, where it's a middle ground, where there's, there's widespread collective violence going on. But it's, does it rise to the level of conventional war? Is it the same as conventional war? Probably not. And in those contexts, the move governments make is they argue that they should have some kind of hybrid legal regime 
where human rights law and the law of war kind of get put together in an ad hoc way. And what that allows governments to do is create exceptions to policies like don't torture. Don't torture is a really interesting example because torture is prohibited in domestic human rights law and international human rights law, and it's prohibited in the laws of war, and yet somehow if you make a hybrid of those two regimes, you end up with an exception for torture like that. That's an interesting argument. Um, and another interesting feature in these gray zone conflicts is that they're really prone to victor's justice. So there's a really strong asymmetry between the overwhelming access to the international legal architecture and the legitimacy of the international legal architecture that favors the counterinsurgent and to which the, the insurgent is ordinarily vulnerable. And we might we might need to correct for that in international law. Thank you, Ian, for this engaging and thought provoking talk. It has special value coming from someone who's had your background. And I'm sure that our esteemed colleagues have a lot of comments and questions, so if you're ready. Let me just break the ice. I'm, I'm sure that uh, we should expect a very lively discussion. Uh, it's a very rich and interactive talk, and thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and I would, I, I should have many questions, of course, uh, but I will choose only two or three. First, regarding the distinction of Bellum in Bellum and the uh, issue of legality. It seems to me that uh, the legality issue comes only within the in bellum sphere, because of bellum is just uh, the concept of about what the law should be. The just cause, uh, cause in just law theory is the most suspicious one. But within the, uh, in theories of punishment, I encountered a very interesting situation regarding the most uh, grave crimes. And they were uh, described as uh, cruel and unusual. But in, in the end, it turns out that cruel is always defined in terms of unusual. What is unusual in a specific time will be designated as cruel at that particular time, not in other times. So that's, that's the reason why in Bella rules are uh, so different in different times, in different places. Uh, so uh, in that sense, double standards are very, obviously, very dangerous uh, uh, terrain because they are leading to what we call victor's justice, which is a kind of justice at all. So that's, that's, that's maybe a comment. Uh, the question regarding the torture. Uh, in my, my opinion, the main problem there is the attempt to legalize torture, uh, not the fact that it, you had the same point by saying the problem in Abu Ghraib was with photographs, but the real problem wa was uh, the real attempt by the United States government to legalize it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, legalizing it's supposed to be based in some uh, scheme of justification in military terms as something that is militarily justified. Uh, but what do you think is torture? I had once in the States a student who claimed that torture uh, is never, uh, or almost never, militarily justified. It's mostly uh, an opportunity to exercise sadistic needs that many or most or maybe all of us have, but they are disguised and uh, annihilated or, or by, the, by the laws and the, the threat of punishment. But in the case where there is no such a threat or, a, or someone's nature comes in the front, so it might be uh, satisfying that human need to be 
sadistic or to create conditions for, 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 for sadists. But uh, from the military point of view, the question is, uh, can it ever be militarily justified? And when we come to that level, we face the following uh, question. Uh, if we say conditional yes, we have to add that uh, that condition implies that the price is very high. So the, the, the price of a torture must be very, very high to be, to be justified. And legalizing it is lowering the price it and opening the room for uh, exercising torture on a regular basis, uh, as it were. Uh, so the price of the torture might be, and that was our conclusion there, so high that it's almost always overpassing any possible benefit. And that's the main point, which brings us to the crucial part. Can it ever be justified, which is a famous ticking bomb uh, problem. So, uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, can torture be legalized? No, no, it cannot be legalized, but uh, can torture be justified ever. And one further comment regarding the uh, and that's also very interesting, you have that dialectics ex post facto ex ante facto. So that opens the huge problem of so-called non-culpable non ignorance. You don't know what will happen in the future, and uh, the future will bring the change of criteria of evaluation, which is a serious problem. So, uh, is it a case of victor justice when uh, you said that, that ex ante facto, Rangelis did not know uh, that it's futile, but it's been said that he could, uh, uh, he could retreat, that's not the, 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 the valid reason, in my opinion. You always can retreat, you can surrender, you can capitulate in advance, etc. But the real issue is how can he know in advance not only what will happen, but what was really necessary, because ex post facto it was not necessary, but ex ante facto has been perceived as being necessary. Yeah, so this is an issue. So non culpable ignorance issue is very, uh, uh, I would say, very hard to. That know. question was at the heart of my master's thesis in political science. So I did a master's in political science, and one of the questions I had is it ever in the strategic interest of a liberal democracy to torture? And the structure of the argument, it's different from most arguments about torture. Most, most arguments about torture are that it's never effective. And my argument was something like, the costs almost always exceed the benefits, which is something that you were saying. But it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because if, we'll use Algeria as an example, or Abu Ghraib, which I think is another good example. Did torture by the French contribute to the French losing in Algeria? I would say yes. Now it's hard to prove that for a variety of reasons, a lot of endogeneity, etc. We can ask the question: Did the U.S. torture program contribute to the U.S. losing in Iraq? And I would say yes. Again, difficult to prove that. But as a theoretical point, I, I would structure it something like this: Torture who and for what? And if you're looking for intelligence about low-level IED makers, that there's a lot of them, but they're not particularly important to the insurgency. You could target them with torture, and it might work, and it does work sometimes. But you're going to throw out a wide net, and you're going to get a lot of false positives, and you're going to torture innocent people, and that's going to fuel the insurgency. The problem is that as a matter of institutional learning, 
counterinsurgent forces put a lot of value on a true positive. Somebody threatens to kill a detainee and they prevent an ID strike that saves one of their soldiers' lives. The feedback is immediate, it's positive, the, the causal chain is really obvious. Torture works. When U.S. forces torture an innocent person or a, a guilty person and there's a negative effect, the population turns against the United States. The causal process is a lot harder to see. And the torture and the consequence, more support for the insurgency, it's harder to assess that. And so it tends to be undervalued in decision making. We can look at Iraq more and go, well, that's obvious. Abu Ghraib contributed to the US defeat. But for counterinsurgents in Iraq at the time, that feedback loop is broken. We could try to mitigate that as counterinsurgents, counterterrorists, and we could say something like, all right, we're not going to throw out a wide net. We're not going to go after low-level targets. They're not valuable enough to merit all the backlash we're going to get from a torture program. We're only going to go after high-value detainees. People like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the overall in charge of all overall operations for Iraq or for Al Qaeda. The problem with that is that those types of individuals are extremely ideological motivated, and they're trained to resist torture, provide false information, provide information in a slow manner so that their organization has time to react. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is a really good example. So the CIA will frequently cite Khalid Sheikh Mohammed as an example of torture working. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was tortured, and I think he was waterboarded more than 70 times. And then he supposedly broke and provided information. Okay. So I've been tortured. Among other things, I've been trained to resist interrogational torture. And the question is, what information are you allowed to give up, and in what kind of manner? And I, it, it's not the case that I was responsible for never revealing information. It's the case that I was responsible for making that information of limited usefulness. And that was what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was charged with by Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda didn't expect Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to not reveal any information. They expected Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to delay revealing information long enough that it wasn't really useful. And so what Khalid Sheikh Mohammed probably did was he said, I don't like being waterboarded. This is not fun, but I can put up with it. And I need to put up with it long enough that Al-Qaeda has time to react to the fact that I've been captured. Okay. And so then what he does is he sits there, not sits there, he endures waterboarding. And he's like, is this long enough? I'm not sure. Maybe I should wait a little bit longer. Is this long enough? I don't know, I'm not sure. But somewhere around 70 plus times is when he says, all right, I'm pretty confident that Al-Qaeda's had time to react. I can provide some information now. And that's, what, what that means is that the whole argument, the ticking time bomb argument, that we need this information fast, therefore we have to use torture, is flawed. It's flawed because you can get information, but you can't get it fast. And if you can't get it fast, then you have to ask, well, what's the marginal trade-off between using torture and some other method? Because the argument against other methods was that they take too long. Well, now torture takes too long. So now we have to make a comparative trade-off of the different means available. So the argument is actually more sophisticated than it initially appears, but at the end of the day, you end up with the same basic conclusion, which is the costs of torture consistently outweigh the benefits of torture, so you just shouldn't torture. Uh, but there are two different points there. One is, uh, it, it, it can be seen in the movie Imitation Game, which uh, uh, is the, uh, where, where you have the case that uh, a brother of those who broke German uh, code uh, 
might save his own brother on a ship which is uh, coming from the United States, but actually couldn't because it will be revealing that they brought the coal. So that the issue of the price is the other issue is that, uh, something that is even higher than that. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, France uh, was the fifth. So even if successful torture, in the end, it will be actually counterproductive. So that is the, uh, the point at which you see that it cannot be legalized. And even if performed, it could be, it, it, it has to be kept secret and not recognized. So that's something uh, of a kind of publicity in the commanding uh, process, which sometimes might uh, bring the commander in a very curious uh, uh, situation that uh, 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 he or she has to stubbornly deny any uh, torture and cannot know if they did it or not. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's counterproductive on the, on the uh, general level because the uh, state of affairs uh, or state of the world in which torture is legalized is axiologically and politically very low and very much lower than anything, uh, anything else and it destroys the worth of all the goals that you might fight for. Yeah, so that's the other problem. And this, is, this is something I'm writing on right now. And it's, it's, we tend to misunderstand why torture is categorically prohibited in domestic context. It's, it's often thought that it's categorically prohibited uh, because it's, it's cruel and unusual. And we don't want anything cruel and unusual as a punishment. And that's a reason, but it's not the only reason. The other reason is that it's traditionally used as a tool of political oppression. It's not primarily about interrogational ability. It's, it's about sending a message to a political group that if they behave in a certain way that's contrary to the regime's interests, that the regime will torture them as punishment and in order to deter other people from being politically active. Uh, I've also been tortured in that capacity by the United States. It's unpleasant. Uh, the upshot the of that is once you start doing that, you're no longer a liberal democracy. Like, liberty's not a real thing anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only about it being that's cruel and unusual. That's and this is why I limit my argument about the effectiveness of torture to liberal democracies. Because for authoritarian states, torture can be quite useful. It's not primarily useful to gain information. It's primarily useful to repress dissidents. Thank you very much for uh, a bunch of things that we really heard today. And uh, unfortunately, I will skip the, the basic philosophical argument, which I think is very elegant, the way you develop basic uh, 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 old Syrian approach and so on. But I would like to focus on two other issues that let me say more practical and following what you have actually started now. The first, let me say, bunch of issues. Uh, I, uh, uh, about the, your, your basic argument, uh, can uh, uh, liberal democracies uh, endorse torture in some way, or which is connected with the factual, let me say, uh, idea or the question or issue if it is useful at all, and so on. Definitely, we should all agree that uh, in uh, there are many cases for the history. Uh, in which the torture was used in a very efficient and useful way. And my argument is actually, uh, for example, there, there is the, this famous uh, case from 1683 when the Turks opponents were saved in the, uh, uh, Vienna the second time actually. And I, I forgot, uh, I think that they were working on some dig, maybe you know, the, the, the case actually. And the, the Habsburg at that time just caught the guy who was involved with all that, but of course they did uh, uh, put him on a, on a torture and he delivered the basic idea, so they found actually where the, they were kind of digging, so they sent the, the army troopers and prohibited them, and in, in that way they uh, saved 
in some way in the end and so on. But the, the point is actually, uh, uh, just let me summarize, uh, uh, given, I, I think, uh, with all the right uh, normative approach in the moral that you were insisting, with all the respect for the basic humanitarian law, uh, which of course includes uh, uh, forbidding of any kind of torture, I'm pretty sure that unfortunately all the liberal democracies, just like any authoritarian other regime, will use them in some way. Either USA or Germany that has recently done that also in some of the cases when they have, I think, uh, uh, there was also a very uh, famous case when Michael Rosen was uh, writing upon that that they caught the torture who was saving some, some uh, who kidnapped some kid and uh, helping him uh, somewhere, uh, I don't know, for some time who was without the food and so on. And they, of course, didn't hesitate very much to put him on the torture to get the information where the guy was. So it really sprinkled a uh, very big internal uh, 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 debate within the German courts because of their past and so on. But everybody, I mean, from the people, from police, even politicians said this was the case where we couldn't do anything else to save some innocent life and so on. So my point was actually, I never like uh, to hear your idea, I know normative, but in a, let me say, practical way. Uh, Again, you, you, you mentioned torture, but we also got the, the hostess uh, uh, treatment for those who don't know that this was the whole idea that you could take the, uh, 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 away uh, the, the, the privilege of uh, citizenship to somebody like Britain has done also for some of its citizens and send them to uh, Guantanamo and so on and so on, which are all traditionally known uh, uh, instruments not familiar to liberal democracies, but let me say the most developed liberal democracy, that was my, 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 let me say, argument, like USA, Britain and Germany were actually using that in the last 20, 30 years, and I'm pretty afraid that they will continue to do that in some cases, but what they are learning, I've been learning nowadays, how to work to have the photos and to get out with the scan. And uh, the second issue that I would just briefly ask you to comment upon that you said that you will not uh, speak about ICTI here, which is of course for us very interesting in many cases. Uh, but I would like to hear your comment upon uh, uh, attitudes of, let me say, American administration generally toward ICTI and toward ICC. Because on one hand, concerning ICTI, uh, I find it really, let me, I will be cautious with the term, but this is pretty racist in the sense that uh, uh, during the whole proceedings at the ICTI, uh, American administration succeeded to prevent any of its officials to come out to the court. And that's uh, because you remember from Milosevic to Karadzic, they were asking for Bill Clinton uh, and many others who were involved to come in testimony, because in that sense, uh, they succeeded to, uh, that, that was the case uh, and the principle of it, that only people from the area could be indicted and so on, which was very racist because they were not the only ones who were involved. Uh, American administration, British administration was very much involved and they should be brought, I think, uh, at least as a witnesses. I think also as somebody who was involved and might be indicted as well. On the other hand, I'm finishing with that sort for thank you for time. Concerning ICC, as you know, American administration has been against that all the time. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, 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 let me say, making pressure on all the countries around to sign this Article 98 to prevent American soldiers to go to ICC and so on. On the other hand, uh, for 20 years, we were here conditioned, basically, from American administration to give up all of our guys, let me say, to eat. How do you see that? So, uh, that's a lot. So I'm going to start, Sorry. remind me about ICT, ICC in a minute. I'll start with 1683, and my really quick response is, Habsburgs weren't concerned with preserving democracy. Uh, a good objection to that argument is that they were at war, and even if they had been trying to preserve democracy, it was worth it. Uh, I'm sympathetic to that argument. I wonder 
the, the, the question that you're going to get is, if you allow for the exception, this is a familiar legal argument, does the exception then swallow the rule? Uh, and this is the problem with the German case. Is The German case is interesting because they didn't save the kid. They did get the suspect to reveal the location of the kid, but the kid was dead. Uh, that doesn't mean it wasn't valuable, but it does mean that they didn't get the information in a timely enough manner to prevent what they ultimately wanted to prevent. Uh, the question you're going to get in the German police case is, if you allow police officers to torture suspects, what's going to happen over the long run? Are innocent people going to get tortured? What are police forces going to start to look like? And there, I think, I, I, feel, I feel like I'm on very strong ground that that police force is going to become fundamentally antithetical to democracy. I think it's going to start looking like sheriff's departments in the southern United States during the height of institutional racism. Uh, it'll start to look like contemporary U.S. police departments that have endemic problems of torture. Uh, and so what you, what you want to do is, is a polity is prohibit torture categorically uh, and it, accept that some of these cases, like the exceptional case for the German police officer, might inhibit security and justice. But we do this in the criminal justice system anyway. We accept that a trial by jury system is going to allow some people who are guilty and who are a threat to other people's safety to go free and continue to threaten other people. However, we do that because we have to balance that not only with the rights of innocent people who are going to go through the trial process, but also, and this is what I think frequently gets omitted <coughs> from contemporary debates, we want to balance that against the power of the state and the state's ability to use whatever institutions we set up to undermine liberty. And that's a follow-on to your ICTY, ICC question. Uh, it's an interesting question for the 90s, and it merits investigation. But now it's pretty much mute. I'm here to tell you the United States is not a liberal democracy anymore. I mean, Europe, I might not go back to the United States this summer. And the questions you need to be asking yourself have less to do with whether or not you can hold the United States accountable but how both U.S. and Russian influence can be kept out of your domestic system. Um, so, it, it would have been an interesting question and I use and I'll think about it. I don't have an all things considered view. Uh, but thinking about the ICC and ICTY now, um, the United States is not your friend and they're not going to subject themselves to ICC anyway, so why treat them in that manner? Like it's just, you can, you can spill a lot of ink about the way the world might be. That's just not the way the world is now. I think in the 90s, that was more plausible. I think now it's just not. So, guys, we the European studies. Uh, you've par partially already uh, answered to the question of what to pose that concerns uh, the, state of, uh, the state of liberalism in the United States, the state of uh, basic human rights and, and uh, uh, democracy. And it concerns the um, changing of the police culture as, uh, as a consequence of, uh, of what is happening abroad. So in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, we've seen the military vehicles uh, being more and more present uh, within the police departments across the U.S. Uh, from my personal experience, when I, when I lived in the United States, uh, I, I have uh, reconsidered my uh, thoughts about Milosevic's police, which I thought that I thought Milosevic's police is very impressive and so on, but then when I saw how arrests are being conducted in the United States, for what we were, I mean, as demonstrators and pe people in, in Serbia doing to the police, uh, we would have got ten times killed uh, you know, <laughs> uh, in the U.S. Uh, but, but, so, so, my point is that even back in 2004 and 5, when I was in the U.S. and, and uh, the, the, these vehicles were not visible, uh, they were not imported basically from, from, from Iraq and Afghanistan war, wars, uh, 
uh, did something change? Uh, uh, and uh, is uh, uh, torture being conducted more uh, when, when, uh, when it comes to the domestic issues, meaning uh, ordinary arrests? Uh, uh, how are the SWAT teams uh, uh, conducting themselves when arresting people? Uh, so what I, what the essentially question is, is you know, in, in short terms, is whether uh, the war experience from the last uh, 10 or 15 years has uh, backlashed and damaged uh, the quality of, of life and human rights uh, uh, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's let's start with torture. So the best book to read on this subject is a book by Darius Rajal. It's called Torture and Democracy. If you can read one book, it's that book. Uh, it's really long because it's very detailed. There, are, if you, you can only read some chapters, that's okay. I think it's chapter 24, maybe that's the most important. And then there are a lot of case studies about democracies that torture. Uh, and the basic thesis is that democracies torture, but they torture using stealth torture, which was a point that was brought up in the previous question. And so it's not so much that they don't torture, they use a different type of torture. Uh, and one of the ways that torture spreads, it's almost like a mentorship guild network. So think of my stories, right? I said, well, I was in a class with a senior officer, and that senior officer said, this is how you need to torture. So he's a mentor teaching a bunch of people coming to the organization, this is what you need to do. Think of what the, the non-commissioned officer said to me when he said, um, what was wrong about Abu Ghraib is that they took photos. So he's not only saying we ought to torture He's saying we ought to torture in a stealthy way, stealth torture. Uh, now, these guild networks tend to intersect between military organizations and policing organizations in interesting ways. One of the ways is that many people, after they leave military service, go into policing organizations. And so you end up with bleed over. And then the institutional learning, it kind of like infects the police force. Uh, currently in the United States, it's not limited to torture. As a matter of fact, I don't think the primary problem is torture in the United States. I think the primary problem is surveillance. But that's, uh, what happened after September 11th was there was this clamor for destroying barriers between agencies. Really clear examples are intelligence agencies. Uh, breakdown in the barriers between the FBI and the CIA, uh, and then the strength of organizations that occupy the gray space between domestic, international, between war and peace. Those organizations got a lot stronger. Special Operations is one of those organizations. The NSA is one of those organizations, and then other organizations associated with the Department of Defense that are in that gray space got a lot stronger. All of that happened, and there was a barrier of secrecy, so the public couldn't see what's going on. The net effect is that U.S. intelligence agencies start to look less like the United States prior to 9-11, and more like the KGB prior to 9-11. And so the distinction between the United States and Russia domestically is a lot less stark than most people think. Um, and most of that is behind closed doors. There's like a smoke and mirrors game going on in the public image where people think the United States, well, Americans tend to think the United States is free when it's really not. And they tend to think of the Russians as the really bad people in the room. But that's actually not as true as they think. It's actually the, the two governing structures have started to look more and more similar. And so what's happened is that the U.S. has become extremely effective at influencing domestic politics, but doing it in a stealthy way. Uh, 
in a way that subverts freedom. So you're not going to see everything that's going on. But for example, you can talk about torture. Like why was why was I tortured using self torture? Right. So I was tortured in such a way that if I tried to explain it to you, it's completely implausible. So that they need, this raises the question: Well, why? Well, my best hypothesis. I don't know the reason, but my best hypothesis is that I was tortured to send a message to other people, because I was in that grazing, I was in special operations. Send a message to people in special operations, the CIA, the NSA, that if you stand up, even in the way I did, because I was clearly justified, I wasn't really trying to make waves, I was saying, why are we doing this? This doesn't make sense to me, here's my argument. Um, even a person like that will, we, will be destroyed to the full extent that we can in this manner. So if you're in this organization, don't ever do that. Uh, and so what it does is it enforces a really strict obedience to orders, even in the Commission of War Crimes. Uh, so, so torture is more selective, but then you've got widespread surveillance problems that lead to monitoring of different organizations and influencing those organizations. Um, and then when people do speak out, uh, now like Snowden's Okay, and then he just left. He went to Russia, and he's like, I'm not. And then Bradley Manning is in prison. What's that? Bradley Manning is in prison. Yeah, and Bradley Manning is in prison. Brad, Bradley Manning is an odd example. Um, I'm not sure that if I would, I would cluster that in the same category. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a lot different. Uh, but I don't know all the particulars. Mm -hmm. One of the things, based on my personal experience, which I can't completely convey to you, I am really skeptical when people who whistleblow on surveillance are accused of being crazy or, or having really anomalous personality traits that then are, are, are the type of thing that cause disgust in human beings. So recent accusations that, um, why is his name escaping me? I know it's Assange. Yeah, Assange. Accusations against Assange. Maybe they're true, maybe they're not. I really withhold judgment because of what he did, and I said that's the, the nature of the charges are the type of things that people find disgusting, and it's exactly the type of the thing that the CIA would use to try to exact retribution and punishment on someone for whistleblowing on the CIA. Like if you if you want to see a hallmark, it's not going to be an assassination. It's going to be that that person does something or acts in a way or is accused of acting in a way that's really socially deviant. And then they can just label it. And then everyone looks at it and goes, oh, that's horrible. Please, I uh, recommend you uh, Libido Brunandi book by Michael Lee Jones, because he exactly uh, explains uh, how uh, this technique was created uh, and how it was developed for the last 200 years, uh, since the time before the French Revolution. Michael Lee Jones, he's an American scholar, a Roman uh, Catholic uh, theologian. He's not a priest, but... Uh, Thank you. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, maybe the argument's more on a philosophical about liberal democracy. Uh, if, if you torture someone, then you stop being a liberal democracy, or you're damaging your own liberal dem democratic cause because you have came to war because of some liberal democratic idea. Uh, the, the, the idea of international criminal law is pretty much universal. And it has to make way for countries that are not liberal democracies, that are communist or quasi communist, that are one way or the other authoritarian, quasi dictatorial, dictatorial. So the, the, uh, uh, the prohibition of, of uh, torture, which is universal pretty much anywhere in a normative sense, and uh, when you fight against that, if you try to, to uh, in practice, it should not necessarily come from the position of liberal democracy. Because the, the wars, are not, uh, the, the, the intervention in Iraq, the bombing uh, attack on Iraq is not uh, emblematic of, of modern warfare. There are so many civil wars out there, uh, from Yugoslavia to Africa to, to, to Middle East, and uh, saying that torture is not good because it's going to undermine your own liberal democratic standing or your own liberal democratic fiber, it doesn't resonate very much in the actual world. So the, the whole philosophical argument that's based on liberal democratic values is not a, necessarily a good way to go when thinking about that. Do you, do, do you have a comment on that? Because this is how I got this... Uh, I think it's a good way to go. This, this center a bit from liberal democratic ideology in the broader sense of the term. I think it's a good way to go if you value 
So I value human freedom. I probably value it more than any other value. So I'm not so much a pluralist as some people. Uh, I understand the countervailing arguments. Uh, I think as a descriptive matter, the international legal architecture mostly favored liberal democracies until September 11th. Uh, and I think prohibitions against torture are a good example. Uh, they tend to put totalitarian regimes in a bind where they have to try to prohibit torture in a certain context and their regime isn't really designed to do that. And so long as liberal democracies can press that advantage, they have a strategic advantage over totalitarian things. However, I think the international legal regime is no longer liberal democratic. And the reason it's not is because of September 11th and the counterterrorism, uh, le the legal changes in response to counterterrorism, what it did is it changed the legal architecture so it was possible to do things like torture and legitimize things like torture. And so one of the interesting features is the way that traditionally authoritarian regimes support counterterrorism law and counterterrorism exceptions. So it's really odd in some place like Saudi Arabia rails against terrorism and it's in the same camp as the United States in advancing counterterrorist legal agendas. Counterterrorist, it's really hard to separate counterterrorism from state oppression. State terrorism. Yeah, exactly. State terrorism. And so, in my opinion, I can concede that point and say, well, yes, if you think authoritarian states are the way to go, you're right. Um, if you can find some middle ground, I'm happy to entertain that argument. I don't see that. I think one of the fundamental problems we face now is that historically, freedom and economic well-being have been a bundle. And we can see that in the Cold War. Freedom and economic prosperity for NATO outstripped economic prosperity in the Soviet Union. But we're reaching a point now where that might change. It's not clear to me that Chinese people are that economically disadvantaged over the long run to Westerners. And so people might have a legitimate option where they choose to give up their freedom in order to achieve economic affluence. I think that over the long run that's a horrid mistake because you're basically enslaving yourself. Uh, you're, you're, you're trusting government institutions that historically have proven themselves to be completely unreliable when you give them that much power to continue to provide affluence and give up some of your freedoms. But it's, it's more realistic of an option now than it used to be. Uh, so the argument that you mentioned, I don't think it was necessarily appropriate in the 20th century, but it might be really important for the 21st century. Yeah, I'm sorry, don't forget Operation Cobra. So this in the 80s, there are a lot of you know, cases with a clear, clear let me say, uh, factual uh, uh, proofs that USA administration, at least parts of them, were very much willing and supporting, torturing, all the kind of miscarriages, and some really uh, uh, horrible things like taking away their children or the uh, 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 I don't know, something is the whatsoever or in Argentina and giving that to the wealthy people and so on. So, you know, just question your idea, was it really before 1911 everything so pro uh, the moments in the world? I, I, want, to so be fair, I want to be very clear about this because that that's a misunderstanding. I'm talking about the domestic politics of the United States. Yeah, okay. So liberty in the United States is compromised. And that was the FBI-CIA divide to some degree, with the notable exception of institutional racism in the United States. So the FBI is used against, against African Americans, um, maybe against socialists too, I'll, I'll bracket that. Most of this type of wide-scale torture, stealth torture, is used 
in foreign countries in proxy wars against the Soviet Union. The justification is it's necessary to defeat the Soviets. But it's, it, it, it leads to widespread oppression. So just on a personal note, I wasn't completely naive to that when I decided to join the U.S. military. One of the reasons I joined the U.S. military was because it was the 90s, and that justification had gone away. And my assumption was that since the justification that we have to defeat the Soviets had gone away, that now it was time to go work in those countries that we had really messed up. Like, we, we, Iraq is a really good example. A lot of Americans, for whatever reason, don't realize that the United States supported Saddam Hussein. I said, well, they support Saddam Hussein, the United States supports Saddam Hussein because it was supposedly necessary to defeat communism. Uh, Cold War's over. Now we can try to fix some of that. We can go into Latin America. We can go into the Middle East, these places that were intentionally basically ravaged during the Cold War, and try to help those people recover from that process. Uh, that was one of the roads we could have taken in the 90s. And the United States elected not to go down that path. And that's why I'm fairly, I don't think I consider myself an American anymore. The United States, instead of going down that path, decided to exacerbate oppression. Uh, to the point now where I can barely tell the difference between Russia and the United States. There's a veneer of an appearance, and then there's what really goes on in the deep state. And I think Russia and the United States are more similar than dissimilar, and I think the EU is more dissimilar to both Russia and the United States. Um, so, so it, it returns. What you have exported to the case with Terrence Hall. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I don't think. So much. It's the same as yeah. So, so much. Yeah. So much. Yeah. Do you have any more questions no. for Ian? That's all. I would like to thank Ian one more time and thank you for attending and your questions.